Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Good to see you out there. Look great today. As we begin, let me ask you a question. How many theologians do we have in the room? All right, we're starting to catch on. We're starting to catch on. If you've ever read your Bible, if you've ever studied a scripture, you are a theologian. The word theology is made up of two Greek words. The first one is God, theos. The second word is logos. Um, it's where we get the word um, to, to uh, I'm sorry, it's where we get the word word, the word of God, the logos, the written word. So it's literally saying the study of God's word or God speaking, okay? Words about God or studying God. So if you've ever read your Bible, you have performed theology and you are a theologian. Now, before you get all cocky and think more highly of yourself than you ought, that does not mean you are a scholar. It just means you're a theologian, okay? Today's topic and this series is talking about the basics of Christianity. We're looking at scripture, we're looking at doctrine, and today's topic is the doctrine of prayer. The doctrine of prayer. And I'm going to begin very simply by defining prayer, and for some of you that think, that is so foolish, why would you have to define prayer? Because I'm going to be honest with you, prayer can be complicated. Prayer can be confusing. Prayer can be misunderstood. Prayer can be hard to do. Let's be honest. If it was so easy to pray, everybody would do it. But studies show that 90% of Christians don't pray. 90% of Christians don't pray. So I'm going to start with a very basic, fundamental definition of prayer. This is the Mike McKelvey translation. It says this, prayer is humanity's way of communicating with God. Prayer is humanity's way of communicating with God. God. An even simpler definition is prayer is talking to God. Talking to God. I've brought two books with me today. I do not have these for sale. I'm just showing you that when I do research and study for a sermon, I do use books and read books. This book right here by Chad Beach just came out. It's entitled Worried About Everything Because I Pray About Nothing. Worried about everything because I pray about nothing. Chad Beach is a very young guy. He, he's doing great in, in ministry. This book was released in 2022, just came out. Great book. And the second book is A Better Way to Pray by Andrew Womack. This book came out in 2007. Uh, this is an awesome, awesome book, too, because it boils down the better way to pray. Instead of begging God and praying weak prayers, there's a better way to do it. Uh, two great books. They have them on Amazon. Uh, link in our description on our video as well. Better way to pray, talking to God, God talking to us, having a relationship with him. Seems easy, seems easy for us to understand, just talk to God. But that can be awkward, can it? I mean, not for the extrovert. For the extrovert, they like to just talk to everybody about anything. But to the 80% of us in the room that are introverts, talking can be awkward. Pastor Mike, you're not an introvert. I actually am an introvert. Um, I do get anxious, like trying to like, think of things to talk to people about. I get refueled and recharged by being alone. But what's different about my introvertness is that I'm 99% assertive, right? So I can walk up to anybody. I can go get whatever I want. I can go open your fridge and get a drink out of it without asking. <laughs> assertive, and that can be confused sometimes. But most of us are introverted. Let me give you an example of how introverted most of us are. You're going to fly on an airplane, and you're going to sit next to a stranger, and you go to your seat, or they go to the seat, and you make exchange a quick, hey, what's up? Hey, good. Uh, yeah. Flying home? No. Uh. And that's it. Conversation's over, right? And then you're either going to turn on a movie or pull out a book or at the very least, you're going to activate your noise-canceling headphones, which is the universal sign for leave me alone. 
And for the next three hours, you're going to sit in utter silence from this stranger who's six inches away from your face, completely ignoring them, wishing they were not there, and you had the whole road to yourself. The plane lands, it pulls up to the gate, the seatbelt sign goes off, you can now get up, move about the cabin, grab your carry-on from the overhead compartment, making sure that it hasn't shifted in flight. Now all of a sudden the plane erupts in conversation. The person that you have ghosted for three hours, you are now completely talkative to. Why? Why? Because there's this anxiety of what am I going to say for three hours? What are we going to talk about? Wonder if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to. Wonder if they want to talk about something I don't want to talk about. But when the seatbelt sign goes off, we're allowed to get our luggage, we know that this conversation can only last about five minutes. <laughs> and there's an end to it, and I'm going to get out. The door is going to open. Conversation's over. I will never see you again in my life. And I think prayer has the same anxiety. What am I going to say to God? Wonder if he asks me a question I don't know the answer to. Wonder if he wants to talk about something I don't want to talk about. How long is this conversation going to be? Am I stuck in this conversation as long as God wants to? Or can I be out of it in five minutes when the door opens? For some of us that have been in church a long time and we know how to pray, we think it's simple. We think, man, what is wrong with people? But the truth is there has always been an anxiousness around prayer. Even the disciples went to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Watch this. In Luke 11, 1, one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and I love the fact that he's modeling prayer. They're seeing him pray. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. You may think, teach us to pray. It's just talking to God. Well, you know what? Maybe some of us need some instruction today on prayer because if it was so easy and if it was so natural, everyone would be doing it and we know that everyone is not. Teach us to pray. My desire today is I cannot possibly teach you everything about prayer. Today's quest is to give you some basics on prayer. Here's my conviction. If I made this a deep theological discussion on prayer, it would reinforce the fact that prayer is hard and complex. If I make it very basic and very easy and very shallow, everybody can do it. And then the Bible says this, so that you are left without excuse. Right? 90% of Christians don't pray. And here's what I find funny. We believe in heaven. We believe in eternal life. We believe that one day we're going to go to heaven for all eternity and be with the Lord, but we don't want to talk to him now. <laughs> There's going to be enough talking in eternity. We don't need to talk now. It's just, that's funny, right? Because then you're going to go spend eternity with a stranger that you could get to know now. Just saying. All right. Before we start, I have to admit, as I got into this study, I set out to prove a very intentional point, and my studies taught me, all right? Good theology says that you create a hypothesis, and then you go study that hypothesis. And I found a story in the Bible that was completely against my belief system of prayer. So I will repent in front of you today, but I don't repent, okay? I do, but I don't. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Okay? I found a story in the Bible. Oh, I'm so angry of even saying this. I found a story in the Bible where somebody prayed a prayer in their head and God answered it. And that just ticks me off. Because for 27 years of ministry, I've prayed that you cannot pray in your head and that there's no instruction in the Bible that says you can do it. And I was wrong. 
I was wrong, so let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at me being wrong. 1 Samuel 1.10, and she, her name is Hannah, she, was bit, she had bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. She kept having miscarriages. She wanted a child. 1 Samuel 1, 12 and 13, and it happened when she continued praying, right? She's praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. So she was praying, but she wasn't praying out loud. She was praying in her heart, not out loud. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So I do repent, but I don't repent, and I'm going to tell you why. There is a story in the Bible that says it. But just because there's a story in the Bible that says this is what happened doesn't mean it's an instructional guide on how to pray. Do you get that? This is Hannah's story. God honored her heart. God honored the fact that she prayed this way. She was praying in her head in faith and God honored it. But that does not mean that that is the model for prayer. Now, if you needed permission to pray in your head because I have convicted your conscience, you now have permission to pray in your head. I don't recommend it. I don't think that you can speak to a mountain and tell it to be removed silently. Okay? Um, I, we could go into all sorts of things. This is Old Testament. Holy Spirit hadn't been released on the earth yet. We could, we could decide all that. But if you needed permission to pray in your head, it is in the Bible. But we still ask, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said back to Matthew 6, verse 5, And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray. Number one or number two reason why people don't go to church is because the church is full of hypocrites. Of course it is! Of course it is! Come on, somebody, let's be for real. We all hypocrites. We know we should be on a diet and eating better, and we don't do it. That's hypocrisy. You know you should go to the gym and walk on the treadmill, but you don't do it. That's hypocrisy. The Apostle Paul, he was a hypocrite. Ooh, Pastor Mike, you're going to hell. No, I'm not. Paul says, I know what to do and I don't do it. I war against myself daily. I'm supposed to be this way, but I'm not that way. I'm supposed to do this and I don't do it. That's hypocrisy. Of course the church is full of hypocrites. How are we supposed to get help? How are we supposed to move from glory to glory and become better people? Of course we're going to start as hypocrites. Of course. But Jesus is not talking about that. He says, don't be like the hypocrites for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then the Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your heavenly Father knows what you are in need of before you ask. Amen. <laughs> Let's break this down. Jesus is not saying that loving to pray is a problem. Could you imagine? Don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray. Wait, what? <laughs> loving to pray is not the problem. Loving to pray to be seen by others is the problem. Right? Prayer wasn't the problem. Loving to pray is not the problem. Wanting to be seen is the problem. Your heart condition is the problem. Jesus is saying your motives behind praying, your motives behind helping others. Like, are you the person that goes and does community outreach just to get a selfie doing it? Fed 5,000. <laughs> Help the lady across the street. Uh -huh. <laughs> Turkey drive. Like, why are you doing it? Do you want to help people or do you want to be seen helping people? Is it good for your social media campaign? Or do you genuinely want to help somebody and move their life forward? And this is what he's talking about, the heart behind praying. 
Then he goes on to say, don't be like them who keep babbling, keep rep repetition prayer. You don't need to be like that. Don't need to keep babbling. Don't need to keep praying. You can ask once and it's done. God knows what you need of. Oh, man, so now this holds a little bit of weight. Like, he tells us here, don't keep asking because God knows what you need of. But wonder if I do keep asking. Is that a problem? Am I wrong if I keep asking God for the same thing because I haven't seen it yet? I used to think it was. Actually, I went to a Bible school that said it was. My Bible school, which was a faith, like a very faith, hyper faith school said, if you have to ask God a second time, then the first time you weren't in faith. I had a problem with that. I had a problem with that. Because there's a verse in the Bible. Let's read this story. In Luke eleven five. 5. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside says, don't bother me. It's midnight. The door's already locked. I'm in bed. I got my CPAP on. <laughs> I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up out of bed and give you bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, I love that. I had to, like, that's the NIV translation. New King James doesn't say it as cool. But because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, wait a minute. Are these two stories contradictory? Did the Bible just contradict itself? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Scripture is as authentic and unique as its reader. It is as authentic and unique as our personalities. Not all are extroverts, not all are introverts, not all are choric, not all are melancholy. Right? We all have different personalities that move us and shape us in how we live our lives. Jesus definitely said to the one who has this uh, shameless audacity, pray with shameless audacity. Go for it. The one who needs to go into their prayer closet and lock themselves in solitude and privacy. Pray away. To the one that needs to pray in their head, I have nothing to say to you. <laughs> I'm still upset at Hannah. He's giving us different models, different modes. He's saying, I just want you to pray. I just want you to talk to me. Right? All is faith. All is faith. When you call upon the Lord, you can't do it without faith. So whether it is one time and you believe it's done, or you keep going back <laughs> with the prayer of importunity and seeking the Lord with shameless audacity, it's faith. It is faith. So I want to take this story, this Luke 9, this Luke 11, 9, and I want to break this down very, very simply, okay? I'm going to go children's ministry simple, right? Children's ministry simple. Because if I make it any sort of complex, we now have a reason not to pray. If I make it very, very simple so that everyone can understand, as the Bible says, then you are left without excuse. Ready? Luke 11, 9 says this. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. It's a three-part equation about prayer. It's ask, seek, and knock. And man, I just love how this turns out. Ask, seek, and knock spells ask. It spells ask. Right in the Bible. Ask, seek, and knock. How do I pray? Ask. How do I pray? Ask. Now, for those of us, I didn't talk about this first service. Now, those of us that have a pride problem, we have a problem asking for stuff. But I don't want to ask God for me. You know, other, other people have so many needs. How could I ask God for me? I'm already blessed. Stop it. Stop it. 
This is what happened to my family, like when I was raised. Like my sister would come to me. She'd be like, you know, mom and dad, they buy you everything. Like, how come they buy you everything? Because I ask. <laughs> but why would you bother them? Like, why would you bother them with that? Like, why would you ask for anything? You're just so greedy. Because I ask. <laughs> now, I will tell you, growing up, that did not always work out for me. As a child, I knew where the cookie jar was. This is back when we had cookie jars. Right, this is back when moms baked fresh cookies and not like out of a, you get what I'm saying? Okay, I'm not, no shade, just, my mom was kind of a baker, so we had like chocolate chip cookies. I'm like, mama, can I have a cookie? And she'd be like, no son, not until after dinner. Mama, can I have a cookie? No son, no, seriously, just like this. No son, not until after dinner. Mama, can I have a cookie? If you ask me one more time, I'm going to give you a spanking. Just one cookie. Wow! <laughs> She'd leave the kitchen. I'd pull the stool out, climb on top of it. She'd hear the jar open. Michael! And just away, like, I'm gonna get that cookie. You know what I'm saying? That's importunity. I'm going for this thing. And it didn't always work out for me, but later in life it did. Right? Later in life is. As there was things that I needed for school or whatever, for my car. My dad loved blessing me with stuff for my car. I thought, hey, Dad, I, I know that these, this car got rims, but, like, can I get better rims? <laughs> you always asking, yeah, ask. Ask, like, shameless audacity. Why wouldn't you ask your heavenly Father to lavish you? Now, I'm, I'm going to give you this. There, there's some balance. There's some balance. Here's my, here's my picture of what God has done in my life. God has given me a box of blessings. All the blessings that are mine for my entire life. A toolbox may be it. Everything that's in that box is mine. So I want it all. If God has designated it for me, I want it all. I want everything in there. I want to play with it. I want to take it out, take it apart, put it back together. It's mine. I don't want anything that's not mine. I don't want anything that I'm not entitled to. But if the scripture says that there are things that are mine, I'm going for it. I want to play with it. <laughs> Ask. Ask him. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says, do not be anxious about anything. We've got a problem in society today. Anxiety is through the roof. Anxious about everything. Anxious about everything. Talk to my kids, man. Anxiety in school today, especially post-pandemic, anxiety is wild today. And the scripture says this, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, there it is, asking God, with thanksgiving. That's a big, big issue. That's the issue right there. We're not really thankful. We're not really thankful people. We may say thank you when, like, the grocery store clerk helps you bag your groceries, but we're not really thankful people. Like, I'm going to give you a tool could change your day. When you wake up, before you go to work, take a moment and write down three things every single day that you're thankful for. Three things that you're grateful for. Not the same three things. Every day has got to be something different. Gratitude. What am I grateful for? What am I thankful for? If you could do that at the beginning of your day, I'm telling you it will begin to destroy and dismantle your neurotic spirit, your negativeness that you go to work with every day. Watch this. With thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all of standing, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. You want peace? Here's the formula. Pray, petition, gratitude. And make your request known before God. Peace comes. He says the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. He says he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. He will keep you in peace and self-control. Now might I interject here that prayer doesn't need to just happen when you are in trouble or hurting or in need. You can pray 
and talk to God just because he's great. Last week I was in Colorado. I was on a big elk hunt. Been planning this for a couple of years now. Going out Colorado looking for the big bull elk. So excited. We're up at 9,000 feet elevation. We hiked up there. Your boy's out of shape. Huff and puff and almost died. <laughs> Thank God I stopped at Walmart before I got there and I got a can of oxygen. Because I was, <laughs> I was huffing that oxygen going up that mountain, man. The air is thin. But I get up there. Never got a shot at an elk. Never, never got a chance to take a shot at a bull elk the whole trip. But I'm sitting up on this mountain on the edge of this area where we're looking down over this valley. We could hear some bugling of elk off in the distance. The sun starts to set over the next mountain ridge. As the sun begins to set, this beautiful, the sky just lights up orange and red and pink as the sun is set in the clouds. And I'm standing and I'm sitting there in awe, a little upset at God that he didn't answer my prayer for the elk, but <laughs> at peace because of this beautiful painting that he's creating for me to, to enjoy. If it was for nobody else, God painted a painting in nature for me to enjoy that night. <laughs> Although a little mad at God, I could also say, Lord, thank you. I believe the highest form of prayer that we can get to is not asking God for things, but simply worshiping Him. Singing songs of praise to Him, I believe is the highest form of prayer that one can ascend to. Not asking, but simply, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, my soul rejoice. I just sing a song to Him of love, that's prayer. Prayer to God. So let's not get it jaded that God just wants to hear our problems. Let me help your marriage. Do not go home and tell your spouse all the crap that happened to you during the day. Right? Psychologically, throughout our workday, we take all the issues and problems and we put them in our pocket. We stuff our pockets, like change, full of the problems. And we think it's appropriate to come home and empty our pockets of all the garbage that happened on the table of our family's hearts. It's inappropriate. It's immature. They don't deserve that. Right? One, if your job is that horrible, quit. Go get a job that's life-giving and fun to you. Right? Come on, somebody. Take ownership of your life. Nobody, nobody creates a bad day for you. Like, I hope you know that. No toxic boss gets to make a bad day for you. Right? We always have the opportunity to clock out and go home. But don't do that to your family. Like, your family doesn't want to just hear all your garbage. Make it a point that before you ever empty your pockets of your garbage, tell your family one great thing that happened to you at work today. Something amazing that happened. How you changed somebody's life. How you made a decision that made the company better. That's, what, that's what's going to be life-giving to your family's soul. And so it is with God. God doesn't want to just hear all your garbage. Tell him your wins. Tell him your dreams. Worship him. In Andrew Womack's book, A Better Way to Pray, on page 147, he says that many of us have a problem with the simple formula of prayer. It can't be that simple. It can't be that simple because I tried that and it didn't work. I asked God for something and I didn't get it. Okay, fair enough. Might I suggest that maybe your formula was wrong? Right? So there's one time I made a cake. It looked beautiful. I mean, it came out great. It looked awesome. Cut myself a slice, bit into it, threw up all over the counter. <laughs> Somehow, don't know how I did it, but I confused the sugar jar for the salt jar. <laughs> or the salt jar for the sugar jar. And instead of two cups of sugar, it had two cups of salt. I 
I could vomit right now thinking about it. (laughs) It looked right. It looked right. It baked right. It smelled somewhat right. But it did not work. It did not work. It was not palatable. You could not even taste it, right? Check this out. In James 4, 3, it's a New Testament, it's the second to last book of the Bible. James is the brother of Jesus. He says this, and even when you ask, even when you pray, you don't get it. You don't get what you ask for because your motives are all wrong. You want only what gives you pleasure. Now, let me give you a little bit of context. James being Jesus' half-brother, he's raised with Jesus. He's seeing that his brother gave his life for a world that didn't want him. And he's sitting back kind of salty in his writing. He said, listen, man, okay, you want to say that prayer doesn't work? You want to say that what my brother did for you doesn't work? It's not enough? It's not good enough? It's not Jesus' fault that your prayer's not working? It's yours. Is what he's saying. It's not that God didn't answer you. It's that you're asking the wrong way. You got a crummy heart. Your motives are all wrong. You're taking selfies, helping someone across the street. You only want what gives you pleasure. Your heart must be right before God. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And according to Hannah, he hears what's happening in your heart too. Right? (laughs) So what's the model, Pastor Mike? In this next three minutes, I want to give you a brief model of the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 9 when the disciples asked Jesus to teach us to pray, he says, well, then pray after this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Right? Let's stop there. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Who are you praying to? Our Father. Our Father. Let's not get that confused. When you pray, you need to be praying to Father God. Okay? Now, here at Family Church, we believe that Jesus is the doorway. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So when we pray, we pray to the Father through Jesus' name. So we say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. That's how we start our prayer. It aligns with the Lord's prayer. We do not pray the Lord's prayer because that would be redundant. That would be repetition. That would be a powerless prayer for us because Jesus also told us that. Don't do repetitious prayer. No one here wants to have the exact same conversation with their spouse every day. Right? We we hope that that relationship grows and that we have new things to talk about. But the model is there. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're holy. Holy is your name. Reverenced is your name. Placing God in that high place in our lives. We're saying, hallowed be thy name. So what we're to do is give God thanks for who he is. Give God thanks for things that he's already done. So I come to the Father in Jesus' name, and I bring gratitude. I bring thankfulness. That may look like this. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you for loving me. For loving me. Not because I'm holy, but you're holy. You are righteous. You are just. You are an amazing great father. Now, that kind of prayer might be hard if you had a very crummy model of a father. It's very hard to think that God the Father is a good father if your earthly father abused you. Uh, Just against anything that you've ever been taught about God, he's not an abuser. (laughs) The cross changes everything about God. Father, I thank you. I come to you in the name of Jesus. You're such a good God. Thank you for loving me, caring for me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us, there's a request, give us this day our daily bread. So here's the model. Come to the Father in Jesus' name. Thank him for something, whatever. It doesn't really matter what the model of thanksgiving is. Then make your request known. Make your request known. Here's what I'm praying about today. God, and here was my prayer for five days as I was in the woods of Colorado. Send me an elk. <laughs> I got desperate. I got, I'm going to be honest with you. I got desperate. 
I said, Lord, you gave Abraham a ram stuck in a thicket. You can send me an elk. <laughs> then, I had, then I had an epiphany. I think the elk were also huddled up. Lord, keep us safe. Protect <laughs> us. And watch over us. And they had more faith than me. Make your request known. And then we call it a Jesus sandwich. Close out in thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that it is done. Salah. It's finished. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right? We're going to close it out. I'm going to give you thanksgiving. You are a good God. Thank you for hearing me. I know that you heard me. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're closing that in a Jesus sandwich. This is a very basic instruction to prayer. Ask, seek, knock. Come to the Father in Jesus' name. Gratitude. Thank you for who you are. Make your request known, whatever that is, and close out in Jesus' name. The Bible says that there's power in the name of Jesus. He's exalted his name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every, every name to a disease, a sickness, an ailment, your finances, it must bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And we do that in faith. We do that in faith, not wavering, not worrying, but in faith. But the first prayer that needs to pray to get to that place is the prayer of salvation. The prayer of salvation. We're going to pray a prayer in a moment. And you're going to notice that I don't pray to the Father in Jesus' name when I start this prayer. It's going to sound a little weird, like, why didn't you, you just taught this whole thing about praying to the Father in Jesus' name, but then when you do salvation, you say, dear God, I come to you. How come you don't say Father? Because to the person who's not a believer, he's not their Father. He's God. He is God Almighty. He is, but he's not yet their Father. Once you accept him as your Lord and Savior and you become a child of God, he is now Father, and it changes how you pray. I don't call my best friend's dad father. I don't call my best friend's dad dad. I call him by his name or Mr. So-and-so. But my father, he's daddy. Pops. I, I never call my dad by his first name. I'm a dad. And I have that place because I'm his son. See, your position changes your prayer. Your position changes your access. Once you become a child of God, you have access to the throne room. You have access to run into your daddy's arms. Now there's this boldness, there's this shameless audacity that comes when I know that my daddy hears me. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd love to offer that to you today. If you're watching online and you've never prayed this prayer, please join us. It goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.